information of all these events can be found in the back. Uh, so now please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. And tonight we welcome none other than Dr. Trek himself, Larry Nemesek from Los Angeles. Nemesek, an author, interviewer, and producer, is an expert on all things Star Trek. This evening we'll focus in on the Star Trek's newest evolution, Star Trek Discovery, and if this newest iteration is still Star Trek to its loyal viewers, and how it attracts new fans to the series. Without any further ado, please give a warm RHPL welcome to Dr. Trek, Larry Nemesek. Or hold it, yeah. Great. Okay, everybody, I gotta start the show now, so we'll see you later. <laughs> People were go. People were starting to answer in. It's getting it's weird. So good night, uh, good evening, everybody. Everybody doing well? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, thanks for being along. I guess let's put the main viewer back into engage there. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody for ha thanks. Thank you, Rochester Hills, and uh, the friends, and everybody who helped bring me out tonight. Um, now, I'm just making sure this is Star Trek night. The uh, cooking with kale speaker is tomorrow night. Just so we're <laughs> just I don't want anybody in the wrong plane here. We're going to Trekland, so just making sure we're good. So um, I always like to. So I, yeah, I was calling this this year trying to be a little provocative, although I'm wow. This just does not want to stay. I get in trouble with using iPhoto because it, uh, when I try to go to full screen, it, it resists me after a few frames. So, so I, um, so I'm going to assume that everybody here is more or less some kind, some era of a Trek fan, which is, which is what we're about tonight. Um, I always like to start off with a little bit of a poll. I, I was calling this, is it still Star Trek for you? Because it's a little provocative. Sometimes I think social media and the world kind of gins up some of the controversies, and no good Star Trek ever got birthed without a controversy at the beginning, before it was quickly forgotten and became the greatest show ever within a couple of years. So just as I, like I do at, at Comic-Cons and places where I talk, I always like to start off with a little bit of survey, so let's just do a hands, a hands up. Let me, if I just ask everybody, vote for one of these now. Just, just a show of hands on what was the Trek that brought you, that made you a fan. As much as you are a, a Star Trek fan, Say, for instance, was it, um, there we go. Oh, I, or Discovery made me do it, because that's what I've been looking. I've been on the hunt for Discovery first fans but this year, but that's been, a, that's been a sidelight. So, okay, show of hands. Who's been a fan with the original series made you a fan? You go back to those days. Okay, and by original series, I'm including the animated, I'm including the, the, the Kirk era movies. Okay, that was everybody. I think it was most everybody. So who came in with the next generation? Okay, that's going to be the rest of the room. I'm just <laughs> so, but I will, I will ask uh, who came in with DS9, although things keep evolving, or Voyager, Janeway's Army, okay, or Enterprise, okay, or the, J excuse me, the Kelvinverse movies, because we have to call them now. Okay. Oh, and did anyone come in with, uh, oh, and Discovery? Did anyone come in with Discovery? I have to yeah, ask now. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one. Did anyone come in with Futurama? <laughs> okay. Okay, excellent. Well, just a little bit about me. Um, I was, my name's Larry Machek. I'm originally from Oklahoma. I've lived in Los Angeles since the mid-90s when I came out. I uh, was very lucky enough to be doing things like editing the National Magazine Communicator, the official magazine for about eight years. Uh, wrote the Next Generation Companion through all its editions. Um, very blessed for that. And five years ago, we got to get back in the realm of the cool out-of-the-box ideas with Stellar Cartography, which was a map and book set. And it's just about to be updated. And I realized I didn't uh, bring, put this, oh, yes, I did. So it's available for pre-order now. It's, I don't get anything out of numbers the way Amazon does authors. But uh, the more numbers there are, the, uh, hopefully the more future projects there are. So that kind of thing. So if you enjoy that kind of thing, uh, it's about to be updated for Discovery in about three dozen um, original series pieces. And it comes out October 9th, but you can pre-order. 
now, which is awesome. My wife and I, my wife was an original series fan, and she wound up working on Voyager for five years, the first five years of that show, after my books came out and I got to know the Trek family. And uh, we were pitching stories, and they actually bought one of them, which became the Voyager episode, Prophecy. It was basically the Klingons in the Delta Quadrant. And a lot was invented after us, but it was basically Bolana and a... Um, and a Klingons in the Delta Quadrant story. What's that? What are they doing way out here? Kind of an idea. But over the years, I got to do all kinds of things. Very lucky and appreciate being able to work on the experience at, at Las Vegas, the Star Trek experience. Don't know if anybody got out to see that. In the, okay. Um, doing things like this guy, the blue bearded demon there, is Iris Stephen Bear. I think we're recording this a new commentary for Star Trek VI on the Blu-rays. Um, and just as wacky as it sounds, being a bit of a pundit. Um, five years ago that sounded wackier than it is now because now everybody and their dog has a YouTube show or a Facebook Live show or they're, they're talking or a podcast or something. And um, most of all, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed doing is Dr. McCoy was always my favorite character and I got to play McCoy on what I think is the, the highest quality of all the fan films. Anybody, anybody see any of the fan films, like the Trek fan films that have been online? Yay, okay. There's all kinds of great ones. There's Mom and Pop. We did it in our backyard, in our garage, and all the way up to... And they're all wonderful, and they're all fandom, and that's all very cool. The Continues, I think, is, is amazing. And um, after I... With everything else going on, I played McCoy twice, and then I was still a creative consultant for that family, because it's an awful good bunch of people that were working. But on screen, I actually got to be, over here, uh, civilian number two. <laughs> Uh, on the finale of Enterprise, which has kind of a mixed bag, but these scenes were awesome, with all these guest uh, extras and celebrities and Archer's uh, speech to what was the Coalition of Planets before the Federation. But even then, what I've enjoyed doing over the years myself is, is somewhere between the canon or the background, the in-universe background, and then the behind the scenes, because I started off needing to connect and fill all the gaps and connect the dots with the background facts going back to like B. Joe's Trimble's Concordance and the original tech manual and all of that. Uh, and then finding out as I did my companion book uh, why writers did this, why the designers did that, and what they didn't do. And, um, and helping record a lot of that before it was lost to time because um, there are lots of popular movies, lots of popular TV shows, but there's very few like Star Trek where the second assistant caterers dog's veterinarian is being interviewed by people 50 years later. I mean, it's because people are interested and they usually, and they have something to shed. Maybe I was exaggerating a little bit there, but they have something to, to shed light on. So this is that final scene of Enterprise. You can see the green screen there. Uh, I'm dressed up in my war, which is what Avery Brooks wore in Pardon on the Stars. Um, the, the 50s throwback show with Danny Russell. Uh, but uh, David Takamura and Ron B. Moore are visual effects guys there who were there to monitor the green screen shooting. And uh, Michael DeMera here is the assistant director. Um, that's where I would always gravitate to and try to record those folks and honor them and get those stories out. Because as, as glamorous and wonderful and cool and charismatic as the actors are, and that's where people gravitate to first, um, it's all these guys that make the shows really what they are. Not to take anything away from the, the actors, but from the writers on down, that's, that's really where the... And if you want to talk to them about the guts of a show, that's seven-eighths the time, nine-tenths the time, that's, that's where you would go. So over the years, everything I've done, I just call it, I work in Trekland. <laughs> so that's kind of my umbrella name. And all those little pictures there in the, in the big letters are all pictures I took over the years from the early 90s on. That's Porthos in his van and Ron D. Moore with his mullet and, and the whole ball of wax. And doing things like interviewing uh, I, Aaron Eisenberg there from DS9. So, and today, just for sure, just before we dive into it, uh, The Trek Files is a podcast I do with Roddenberry where we take a file out of Gene's files, with, thanks to his son Ron, and uh, have a guest that we talk about for what it meant then and what it means today whether it was originally the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, something popular, something that never was made. Uh, even we had one from 1959 when he wrote episodes for, uh, and won a writer's school award for an episode he wrote for uh, Half Animal Travel. He was, he was tied for the most prolific freelancer on that show. Which, uh, Paladin was a little bit like Kirk when you look at it. 
But everything I call track line, 4047 is my kind of fan experience company that I put together for people to get some of these behind the scenes folks out to fans around the world. And Track Line Tuesdays Live is a, is a little one o'clock thing I do on Tuesdays. I did it today from, <laughs> from the Carolyn Kennedy Library down in Dearborn Heights um, for about a half hour or so and people can talk back and forth live. So that's kind of, oh, and there's more about them. Um, and then I have a day tours company that I'm launching this fall when we're not working with the big company. But yeah, over, there's Mullet Ron again um, in the fifth season of DS9 and uh, putting landing legs on Voyager with Denny Herter there, who was the miniature handler. There's Marina getting made up. That's uh, the last, about three or four episodes from the end of The Next Generation in the makeup trailer. That's the actual painting of Romulus that was used through Next Generation and, and the films. There was Sid Dutton, who was a wonderful matte painter. Um, and that's why Starfleet women always look so good. <laughs> the industrial Starfleet bra, as Marina Sirtis once called it. So just bits and pieces like that that, um, that, are, that are fun to keep up with. Oh, and, <laughs> and if you want the body of an Orion, you literally have to go to the body shop to get it. You can, it's, uh, that's how they applied the green when they brought out the Orion men finally on, uh, on Enterprise. Um, even down to the fact of getting a potograph from, from Breezy, the dog that played Porthos on, <laughs> on Enterprise, did a, did a feature with her. And of course, a lot of the fun part of, of, of uh, over the years of all the tracks from the next generation on is the graphics and the in jokes and things that especially Mike Akuda brought to it. If you could read the little labels, this isn't even from Voyager or from Enterprise, from the D. This is from the future ship that you saw in Voyager. Um, <laughs> I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Elephant's faithful, 100% Horton. Uh, good to pull out for a library show. There we go. Uh, but this is Portal 47. I can tell you about these since I've got a table over here when we're done, after we've talked Discovery, and if we haven't burned the place down. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I don't expect that at a library. It'll be very civil. I know. I know. So there's all the features. I can tell you about that uh, later on. So one thing... Yeah, get your awes out of the way. So one thing that's been going on since, I say, 2005, a lot of things happened in 2005. I call the Viacom divorce when Viacom split off and CBS went its way and the Paramount features, the Paramount Pictures, and then a few other sidebar things with each one went different directions. And it's, that was the same year that Enterprise was canceled, that Rick Berman, who'd been running things for 18 years, as a handoff right from Gene Roddenberry, uh, Trex creator, um, when his contract went down, and people felt like the world was burned out on Star Trek. I would venture to guess, and I think looking back in hindsight, the producers were burned out on Star Trek because the online world was just starting to explode and the fan films were getting popular and people were, young fans, older fans, everybody were, were using online social media was coming into its own within a couple of years and people were finding ways to make their own Star Trek again. Just like back in the 70s when the show was first canceled in 69, the original run, people, st the, the fanzine writers started doing their own stories. And fanzine culture, which was mostly women, led to the clubs and the conventions and the revival effort. Not that there weren't guys in there too, but a lot of that first 10 years that went to the motion picture was, was women. So over the years though, 90s and the aughts as DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise and some of the audience seemed to tire out or go away a little bit. People were wondering if we were gonna have any younger fans, if, if Star Trek fandom was going to age itself out of, out of existence. Uh, so you can tell here <laughs> that no, that was not a worry. Actually, I'm just kidding because that's actually uh, Gates McFadden's young son when they were still shooting Next Generation. And that was her Christmas card one year. So it's, it's just fun to use it to highlight the age issue with Star Trek. So, you know, part of that, I bring that up because part of that's what's been going on the last 10, 15 years and especially what's a little bit that's going on to our, our topic tonight of discovery. So before I get into that, I want to see what you guys think. And, and we have questions, everybody. You know, uh, it's not so dark that we can't see each other in here. Um, over the years, this is like the $64,000 question that, uh, as a reference, I think I did my next step. Like, why Star Trek? And to me, there are, especially now, the Comic Cons, are, there's you know, DC and Marvel and Harry Potter, and you know, James, the James Bond franchise is still going, Star Wars, of course. There are so many 
great storytelling franchises that have tons of fans and people who are passionate about it. And it's like, why, why Star Trek? Is it just in the, you know, I would say that Star Trek paved the way for all of those, even the ones that were ahead of it, like Doctor Who and, and James Bond, because Star Trek was the one that got the most people. Well, I say Star Trek invented the internet 30 years before it was there, but they just used paper and stamps to do it. <laughs> and it's not like someone said, let's invent the internet with paper and stamps. It's like, here's the thing we care about. I want this information, damn it. How are you going to get it to me? I want to know other people. I want to know what's out there. I want to know clubs. I want to know what I can buy. I want to know conventions. And the fastest way people could do that was paper and stamps. Does anybody know what a SACI was? Anybody remember SACI? Self-addressed stamped envelope. That was the currency of Star Trek, yeah, in the early days. And, and even today, at the time when maybe Star Trek peaked, right before the Comic-Con, what I call the Big Bang Generation you know, uh, victory, when the geeks won, um, in the world, and now look who's, look who's running all big corporations, right? Um, who's sending, you know, the red Tesla into space? Um, but like, why? Why? What's different about, I mean, all these things that have people passionate and fans passionate about them have some things in common. And when I was talking about Star Trek, we talk about that, and people ask that question. Of anybody involved in Star Trek, fans ask it of each other. And I kept coming down to five C words, five good C words. And I will, I usually can pop them out, but, uh, and, and that, those guys are kind of the shining template there, right? Because they, they were the originators. But I would say, to me, uh, and this is special about a, a lot of these popular, we live in this geek world now with all these franchises, all these popular passionate fans behind them. So concept, right? If we all, if you're in this room, you know this. I'm not preaching you anymore. But concept, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a future where Earth made it, humanity made it. We didn't blow ourselves up, we didn't poison the planet. Oh, look, we're out, and, and we're doing exciting things like exploring space and, and making a good fight. Um, characters have to be great characters, right? From Kirk and Spock and McCoy and Scotty, all through all the other generations. I'm not leaving out Sue and McCoy and Sue and Chekhov and, and Chapel. I don't mean to leave anybody out. But um, if you've got characters on paper, that's wonderful, but you've got to have a cast well, so you've got to have those incredible people bring it to life. Uh, no one expected Spock to become as popular as he did. No one expected DeForest Kelly's Dr. McCoy to pop up and get third billing the next year. Um, and all of those characters, the little five, made themselves endeared to people, and by the time the movies were having whole arcs written for them too, so that's all there. And then the commentary and Star Trek being a social force and having little morality tales, right? So, on so many issues. Um, peace and diversity and uh, anti-racism and um, birth control and population control and uh, in the environment, the green movement, so many things. Uh, the cautions of artificial intelligence, right? It, even as exciting as the potential can be. So that's all Great, and you say you look around the world and you see what's driving people to Comic Cons, and all those franchises have that. And the thing that I think gets Star Trek that we love to make fun of, and I go into my fanboy voice and say, I'm sorry, but your 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 cup line is about an eighth of an inch off there on your left sleeve. It needs to be an eighth of an inch higher. That kind of thing. You love it, kind of kid. But the fact that Star Trek made this effort. And even bringing back next generation, saying we're not going to just recast Kirk and Spock and McCoy, we are going to set this one 80 years ahead, and kind of broke open this whole paradigm of a of a universe. And once again, the thing Star Trek was doing in the 80s and 90s, having having multiple shows and feature films going, and having a universe that was cohesive, and even they made mistakes at times. They really, really, really tried um, to to keep it cohesive and to come up with things between the cracks that maybe you didn't see. They were on a graphic and it just added so much richness. People were not getting paid to do all the extra work that they did. And um, they really kept it, kept it uh, alive that way, why people care so much. Sometimes it gets a little weird and angled, but for the most part, to me that's what makes it different than, than oh look, it's every three years there's a new kid playing Spider-Man, or oh look, it's the latest Sherlock and Holmes, or Watson. And, um, I, I, Star Wars is close to that. I mean, Doctor Who is built to change every five or six or seven years. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, James Bond just changes James Bond. And 
the other characters just change over time and no one bats an eye, but because Star Trek didn't start on paper. It started with those images. So the image and the look, you know, maybe second to not only to Star Wars is, um, is really important. They didn't start as comic book or, or paper images. But the thing that's different about Star Trek is people over time, at the key times when there was a restart, really made an effort to kind of keep a continuous line going or, or come up with a reason why and not just ignore it. Even the poor, smooth head, bumpy head Klingons. It took 25 years, but they finally finally came up with the reason why. But I, I just think that the, the one thing we love to make fun of can in there is the thing that makes Star Trek more special than all the other special ones. So that's what leads us into a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask about the other Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> the Orville, which itself is like brought up a little bit of, it's like people can't enjoy both of them. Anybody, everybody? Anybody not seen The Orville on, on Fox? Okay, that's great. It's Seth MacFarlane, right, who's, who plays the lead there. He has an average but yet heroic crew. It's a total homage to the next generation. They even have a, a Klingon type, uh, you know, uh, closed mouth type super alien in the back. I mean, you can kind of see some of the archetypes in next generation. It, I mean, carpeted nice walls in their average ship. Um, but, uh, he wanted to do an homage to Star Trek at the same time that the first new Star Trek in 12 years went so dark, and I'm talking about Discovery. But that alone and some of the things that fans on the surface didn't like about Discovery gravitated a lot of people over. To the point where, like anything else, you can't have people just enjoy everything they have to compete and compare. So I threw that in as a joke, but um, something some people say, the best Star Trek ever is the Orville. It's like, well, no, not quite. <laughs> not quite, not quite. It's these guys. These guys and everybody that they inspired um, for all those C words. So, so discovery. Let me let me get away from your favorite over the years for a second. See. So who who in the house tonight? Which way should I ask? Who has not seen discovery? Okay, about half. Okay, okay. People have all kinds of reasons. I've done a, a survey in my newsletter to see whether they didn't want to watch it, or they didn't want to pay for it, or they'd rather have Blu-rays and wait for that which are coming in November finally, which has been announced, um, or what, you know, what, the, what the thing is. Or a lot of people find a club, they find a friend, they go and they watch it on, on their account, which is, that's streaming. That's, that's the way streaming is. So I mentioned streaming, so you have to get um, Discovery on CBS All Access, which people thought was kind of a piggish move, but it was kind of a trend. It's really the trend of media. Disney is about to come out with a, they're going to, yank all of their products from Netflix and Hulu and everything else and have it just on the Disney Channel. Um, they think they're big enough to do that. CBS has tons of years of programming, but they don't have a lot of original and they're madly racing to fix that. And we'll get into that. So Discovery itself, if you're a little confused. Um, I'm sorry, these shoes are so smooth down the um, <laughs> Four people have enough to watch, so I knew it um, so here's what we call the Prime Universe, which never had a name until the first JJ movie, and they called the new boy Spock Prime Spock, and it was then that became a handle, just when it was needed. So the original timeline here, the original series here in the 2260s, Next Generation, and Voyager and DS9, basically 100 years later, um, Enterprise is about a little over 100 years earlier than Kirk's time in the 2260s, and then the JJ and then the mirror universe just over here totally on its own, because it's an alternate movie. And then uh, a created split timeline the JJ movies in 09 with the Narada and the Kelvin and uh, calling it the Kelvin universe and split off. So the, the JJ movies are down here every couple of years in the 2250. So just to A, one thing is even though they're a different timeline, all the characters are born at the same time, except for uh, Chekhov. Who somehow in the in the uh, Kelvin universe the the, 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 the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chekhov decided to have their their son two years earlier than they did from I feel big here. Um, but that's the Kelvin universe walking along here. They're younger than you see than they are in the city. And that's that. Discovery is taking place here. Supposedly we said ten years. Now they've come up to uh, twenty-two fifty-seven. So. About eight years before you first see Kirk, and more than once gone before, in the, in the first Kirk pilot. So just to set the stage, there's that. 
thanks to Aaron Harvey. And it was started by a guy named Brian Fuller, who's written all kinds of uh, interesting shows, uh, done all kinds of work. Pushing Daisies was one. Uh, Hannibal, which was the take on the character from Science of the Lambs as a series. I knew, um, <laughs> I knew Brian, he was a baby writer on Voyager the first time around, uh, there in the Hart Building, working on Voyager. Uh, this is the first show that uh, Roddenberry has been in the credits of since Gene died, but they approached Rod Roddenberry and his business partner, Trevor Roth, about being down as executive producers. Um, and this is uh, Ted Sullivan, who's a, one of the mid-level writers of the show, and Kirsten Beyer. I have Kirsten's picture in here because she's not on social media. But she uh, is a novelist and wrote several of the licensed Voyager novels pulling in all the rest of the canon when she did so, and Brian reached out to her to have her own staff, of the right, the TV staff. It's the first time that that's happened, the, actually the third time that's happened where a novelist has been in the writing room, but it's the first time that someone's been tasked, the way Kirsten has, with coordinating the comics and the novels to the highest. They're not completely canon, what we call canon, but they're going to, um, they're, they're going to supposedly coordinating and working back and authors giving ideas to the TV writers and, and back and forth. But yeah, so Brian's original idea, one of the failed movies in the 70s that didn't get off the ground was one that was going to be called Planet of the Titans and uh, uh, Ralph McQuarrie uh, did this artwork for it right before the movie, the movie fell apart, didn't happen, and he got a job over with Star Wars in 76 and 77 and wound up designing over there. Um, had a tortured, tortured beginning with Brian Fuller leaving and people coming and going and s people wondering if CBS All Access was going to keep funding this show, but they did because they pinned their hopes for this new business venture on it and they couldn't afford to be humiliated and have CBS All Access fail in the middle of the eyes of the world. So, but the show finally did get filmed after about 18 months of labor, <laughs> tortured labor. Uh, shot it and finally did un unspool their uh, first season about nine months behind schedule and, and get it out in September instead of January last year. And, um, and boom for the, and it was a huge boom for all access, even as a lot of people were thinking we wouldn't do that. Uh, but what do we know about Discovery so far? Just behind the scenes, the cast is very close. They're probably the, probably the closest cast since the Next Generation's cast, I would think. They're also, um, there's been a lot of reboots and redos, and people are in that mindset now. So Rain Wilson, you know, from The Office, other things. Uh, they wrote a couple of instances of Harry Mudd, Roger C. Carmel there in the original, being in Discovery. Um, talk about, we'll get to the reactions, and I want to hear from you guys too. Uh, you, those of you who have seen it, and those of you who haven't seen it, why or what you've heard, maybe your friends. So be thinking about that. Um, this slide is interesting for a couple reasons. One. You told people this was on the transporter room of the Shenzhou, which was an older ship, uh, and people freaked out. That's not a transporter room. Um, they were like, "Well, it's supposed to be an older transporter, but it had vertical signals and not anyway, beaming instead of uh, horizontal beaming." The other thing, though, is that Michelle Yeoh there playing Captain Joju and and uh, uh, Seneca Martin Green playing uh, Michael Burnham there. This is the first show where a captain character has not been the lead. It's a, it was a first officer who then had a major unfair disgrace that she had to work through and come out of. So that's been different. It's the, street, the whole thing of being a streaming show of 13 episodes that were serialized versus standalone stories, uh, that's been a little controversial. It's gotten taken getting used to. It's amazing how people are used to watching Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead that they put their Trek filter on and they want to go back to the 60s or the 80s and have the standalones that all of the local stations that ran reruns used to demand them turn out. That's basically the reason why. The pre-Lost era. But even then, DS9 did serial live shows. Kind of pioneered that. But even on top of all that, it, it's just the times we live in. There was an unfortunate segment of, I don't know if you call them fans or what, but uh, people who saw these scenes didn't realize that Georgiou was going to be spoiler alert. Was, was not going to survive the first two-hour pilot. Um, although she comes back later, because it's Star Trek. <laughs> um, practically everyone who's died on Discovery finds a way to come back in one way or another. I'll just say that. But it's science fiction. But it was Leonard D. Wright himself who said nobody really dies in Star Trek for science fiction. So, and he would know. Um, but then there was a lot of, there was a 
cringe reaction of it, of, uh, of, uh, oh, the two leads are women and their two leads, the two women are women of color, and Star Trek is bowing down to progressive, you know, craziness. I was just like, did you ever watch the show? <laughs> anyway, it's been an odd, interesting, you know, and it's happened in Star Wars and some of the other fandoms and online communities. And for one thing, that's crazy. And the other, the other aspect I keep trying to remind people of is if you're looking at everything through the online world, there's a vast, what I always call the armchair fandom out there. They buy action figures, they buy novels, they watch the shows, and they let their kids watch the shows, and that's where the mass majority of fandom is, not the 5% of everybody who's online, um, you know, or even the people that show up at conventions, because that's, that's a minority of fandom. So, um, but they are very socially conscious. This is, there was a time when movie and TV casts were being shown taken a knee, and months before they were even on the air, the Discovery Bunch, again, they're very close. Uh, writers and actors. And then they just have a lot of fun. This was an accidental thing that happened and they wound up selling these disco shirts and now they're um, a lot of fun. They used them on the show. And, and uh, Mae Wise's uh, uh, Tilly character is kind of comic relief a little bit, although she's grown. And the four characters here all wound up getting nominated for Saturn Awards in the sci-fi realm. So the show's had a lot of success. CBS All Access is very happy with it. They say they've got two and a half million subscribers. They're looking to grow that. Um, and it just did not set well with some of the look for folks, fans who were very, the, the canonies, the background people. And there are things I kind of went at, but then I know that the show had a troubled birth with Ryan Fuller coming and then leaving and keep midway and people picking up the ball and running with it. But even having a, a character call up, um, I think it was Saru, the Kelpian, the Toki alien of this cast. I didn't say Toki alien, but there's always one alien, whether it's Spock or Odo or, or Data, a non-human that can comment on humanity, right? Um, anyway, they called this of him doing research on famous captains. And I always wanted to say, see, they, I think they do their research. Because half the staff are, are old fanboys and fangirls. They know what they're talking about. But to, to capitalize that, to really put a fine point on that, um, well, there's Captain Archer himself. With the, you didn't see, you, did you ever hear about the missing episode, the deleted episode, lost episode, where Porthos was fortified? Captain, Captain Archer had to go rescue. Okay. It's a great slide. Uh, there was a lot of overlap with it. Jonathan Frakes directed two episodes of uh, the first season. They love that. They love that. There he is wondering why. No, I'm kidding. He, Jonathan is the only human alive who is directed on the Orville and um, Discovery. Both. Again, wondering uh, how I'm going to survive this. And this set, you know, we have social media. Now, this is the first Star Trek in the era of social media. It showed them being socially conscious. Then you just get things like Marina Sirtis going up to the Toronto sets and teasing everybody about, oh, look, I'm going to visit my friend Jonathan. <gasps> Marina's going to be on Discovery. Oh. No, not yet. No, we don't know. Uh, but here's Kirsten again, showing off a couple of comic books that she oversaw or co-wrote. Um, again, that's, that's a new thing. That's a new thing. So all these aspects um, of Discover Star Trek through Discovery. The um, uh, Doug Jones, who was just in uh, the, the Shape of Water as the fish guy in that, that I saw on the Oscar stage when they brought everybody up, a good on him. He has labored so many years under all these, he's tall and lanky, has a wonderful form for character work, and he's wearing all that, the Saru makeup now. Um, so this was, a, before the show, they didn't want to give away the Saru alien look, so he had to do his interviews in uniform, but without makeup on. So, so it's kind of an odd, kind of a fun picture. And yet, this beautiful young woman, um, uh, Mary Silich, uh, they have her covered up with this uh, augmented, alien human mask. You see her all the time. She's supposed to be running the spore drive. They've got a host of bridge characters that haven't had many lines, hadn't had a lot of interaction. They promised to, to up that up the second season. And most of all, I think most of you know this guy, uh, Patrick, Sir Patrick Stewart, excuse me. Um, this popped up like in his Instagram or a Facebook page or something, where he was saying, um, somebody wrote this third person about him, quoting him and saying, um, it's fascinating, immensely enjoyable, and creative. It's a creative life that has suddenly come to a halt. This is a very difficult time for me. He's 77. 
I'm very comfortable, I need things. I love working, sitting up late learning lines, doing research and so forth. Instead, I'm just switched off. Sir Patrick Stewart said he hasn't been offered an acting role since last November. And so I said, why? That, he sounds pretty whiny there. That's not, I, I think he could find something to do, but I'm just, I'm wondering if there's something up. This was about, this was like March, April or so. About the time they went into uh, Emmy writing, writing the second season, uh, starting to film the second season. Uh, this was at an Emmy voters event in LA. This was on a Friday, and by the next Thursday, the two showrunners, did you hear that? The two showrunners had been fired. Just at the time you thought, now they're gonna have a calm opening to a season to write with. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> So yes, Gretchen and Aaron are now gone, uh, and Alex Kurtzman was handed back the full-time reins. Alex Kurtzman, who co-wrote uh, two of the three Kelvin movies with J.J. Um, with Abrams, uh, co-wrote them with Bob Orsi. And then he was the first person mentioned when they announced Discovery, with very little detail, and he and Brian Fuller are down as the co-creators. So he very quickly hired a, a writer named James Duff, Who's, who's been working on it, there's Alex. And um, they didn't um, miss a beat very much. This is recent news. I want to get you all up to speed and we can, we can talk a little bit. So right after all that upheaval happened, which was fairly, not only, I don't want to say quiet, but CBS came out and said, yes, they've been, they've been fired for going over budget and for being abusive to their writers, and we're moving on, and, and here's what's happening. And within a week, they announced Al Kirkson is now Mr. Star Trek. Not only that he's been given this big deal to work on these shows, but these well, these well-placed sources who were all over the place, even though they were officially leaked by CBS, <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, uh, and on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, talking about four new, new types of things in the process. One, and they want to fill up all access so people have a reason to subscribe and not feel like it's just a one, a one trip coming. Um, an academy show, which we've been talking about since. Since Gene's talk, and then Mark Bennett had an idea. Um, from Stephanie Savage and Josh Schwartz, the people who did Gossip Girl, uh, the Rudy Dynasty, uh, run, uh, Runaways on the Marvel series. And she actually did, and never credit it, but she actually did a real life NASA story called The, the Astronaut Wives from the book about the Mercury 7 Wives. Um, I, uh, this Rathacon story that admired that wrote. Director of the Rabbit Con, Sergeant and two of the other movies. Um, he's been working on a mini series about Khan's time on this isolated maroon planet before it ended up crazy. So, in between space scenes, in between the Rabbit Con. And an animated series, which people said for decades, why don't you do it? They're cheap, they expand the fact that you get young kids in, young kids can buy action figures, and there would be action figures again. That happened. And then this mysterious fourth season, a fourth series that no one said what it might be. So from very detailed sourced rumors. Then on the other end of things, Variety had that one, uh, Hollywood Reporter, these are the ones that me, came this thing about a Patrick Stewart series. Well, well that's why he's been on, on social media. Um, that they've got to do the deal, but obviously people, people felt comfortable talking about it even in a source like that. So. There you go, this is a Stephanie Savage and her producer that they're talking about doing the Academy series. Hopefully it won't be, they laugh for years about uh, Starfleet 90210. So <laughs> hopefully it'll be a little bit higher plane than that. But this Discovery cast, this was at Comic-Con just three weeks ago. They were all over the place doing wonderful, wonderful uh, work. More Star Trek in the mainstream media and even in the genre at Comic-Cons and things than ever. These are the new pictures from the new season where they ended the first season with the Enterprise pulling up to Discovery with, an, with a distress call that they had to rendezvous and talk, and the news being that Anson Mount, uh, who had been seen in, I've just gone blank, uh, uh, what's the railroad series? I think he was in uh, Wheels. Of, um, anyway, yeah, Hell on Wheels, I think he was in that. But he's awesome. He looks like Jeffrey Hunter that played Captain Pike in The Cage and Menagerie. Uh, but this is the, so there's a little bit of background there. They've gone into the gold and red and blue uniforms, but they're still not the same design line. So we can talk about that. That's a whole issue of 
how much canon is enough canon? Does it have to be exact? Do you only care about story canon, not visual canon and look? But there's Captain Pike. That's supposed to be the bridge of the Enterprise in, in the pre-Kirk time. Tig Notaro, the comedian um, and writer, stand-up, is plays an engineer of another ship that is found in the course of a story. Uh, and Rebecca Romain is playing number one, Major Barrett's part, hopefully with brunette hair yeah. when they get to it. So those, these are the little headlines that have been trickling out just in the last, just in the last month or so. Uh, and meanwhile, if any of you are curious or care <laughs> about the J.J. Kelvin movies, there's supposedly a fourth movie moving along there with, to be directed by a woman, so they're kind of fitting into the Me Too movement. Although just last week there was news, I didn't get it in here, about um, Chris Pine played Kirk and, um, and uh, uh, played his dad. Yeah, Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth, the two Chris's, Chris Squared, um, walking away from table on their contract talks. So we'll see where that leads. It's probably just a ploy. But that's the movie side. Personally, I am just thrilled that whether you, you're in love with it or you like it and you're just excited for the future, the TV side of Star Trek is moving ahead and the world doesn't look at a movie every four years as, as its barometer of what's going on with Star Trek. So just a week ago, or I guess nearly, two weeks now nearly, they shocked, not the shock that there is a Patrick Stewart project in the works, but shocked that it had been unannounced and Alex Kurtzman brought out Patrick Stewart at the big Trek Vegas convention in Las Vegas, the biggest one in, in the world every year, to announce that the Patrick uh, series was happening and what the premise of it was. It'll be real time, so he's 20 years older than he was when you saw him in the last Trek movie, Nemesis, the last Next Gen movie. And um, it was just the total love fest, love wave meltdown, four or 5,000 people melted down Twitter's uh, Patrick Stewart and, and hashtag Captain Picard were trending topics on Twitter that night worldwide. It was it was just huge. And then today, did anyone hear the news? It just broke today, like an hour before I did my live thing at, at four o'clock, four o'clock Eastern. Um, they had been wondering if you would see Spock off the Enterprise, Pike's Enterprise, was number one. Uh, Spock, four years younger than Michael Burnham, his foster sister, and um, they just announced today that Ethan Peck whose full name is Ethan Gregory Peck, who's the grandson of Gregory Peck. Um, this is him with his beard on there, had been cast to play Spock, which obviously has been in the works for a while, but here he is with Adam and Julie Nimoy, and Terry Farrell, Adam's new wife, and Julie's husband, um, being welcomed by you know, the DNA of what exists for Leonard's time there, and, and getting a little, maybe a little genetic coaching there on the side. But um, all the reporter today had that picture of the two of them there side by side. So, you know, they've, they're doing, they're rolling out the headlines here. So the Blu-rays are going to be on sale for season one in November. They're going to do these little one short 15, 20 minute, four episodes of different subjects. A Harry Mudd one with Rain Wilson, uh, a standalone one that Michael Sh uh, Chabon, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who has now become a producer on the new shows coming out, is writing one. Um, and a Saru show and a, and a Tilly show, for those that are the characters. Um, so hopefully... It's going to be directed in unique. No, they're going to show them like once, like on, on CBS All Access. They may pull them off and show them as promotional online, you know, free eventually. But they're going to show these little 20-minute uh, bits as kind of a, you know, get you hungry, get you ready for the new season. And, and the Blu-rays will go on sale about then. So that's, that's their little plan, which I thought was interesting because that's exactly what the, fan, the two biggest fan films have done in the past, is do those vignette type 15, 20 minute shorts. So, um, let's, let me, I wanted to get through all that just to say, uh, there we go. So we've had people, let's just open this up here now. We've had people, um, and I totally wandered away from the microphone I was supposed to use for the taping, sorry. <laughs> it's like, whatever you do, stand on the opposite side of where you had the microphone, Larry. Um, let's, just, let's just see, because it, it's interesting. When I, what, if you read online, the people that aren't watching are usually either people who can't afford the 6 or $10 a month, or they don't want to on principle. Um, and it takes a real, 
you know, a defensive tone online at times, which a lot of things sadly do. Politics, sports, you name it these days. But a lot of people have watched, and there are some folks who say, I would love to, I just cannot afford. And there are people on principle that say, I am going to wind up buying the DVDs or the Blu-rays, and I just don't want to pay up until then. So, because uh, you knew they would be out there. And they'll, they'll have a ton of behind the scenes content. They, they have an after show they show called After Trek. Uh, they've prepared a lot of dot little mini pieces for that. So this is, that's all kind of unspooling and unwinding now. But meanwhile, it's been a year. The world didn't stop spinning, <laughs> even in Star Trek. And um, it seems like more and more people are getting on board or they're finding their way to it. Or they're just finding the friend that has a CBS All Access password and using their password. So I don't know, let's, what's the, anybody here want to jump in and let, let's, how about, who's, who's, we had a lot of folks who had not seen, who has, who has watched Discovery? Okay, so we're like at a third here, okay. Um, anybody have a comment, yay, nay, or um, like what the strongest part of the show was you liked or what you did not like about it? Some people started off watching it and, and quit, so there is that. But I still think the great unwashed silent majority of people are going along because it's the new Star Trek and they'll adjust and, and I, I wish I'd pulled them out now, but if you go back and look at history, we we're talking about Patrick Stewart being like the most unifying, wonderful thing for all the Treks right now, wherever fandom got divided along the way. But if you go back and look at, A, the first season of Next Generation, how many remember how wobbly the first season of Next Generation was? Yeah. If you, if, if you took a poll at the end of the first season, people were so hungry, they were hoping it got better. I think hope was, and I think that's, that's, that's the issue here going on with Discovery. But uh, yeah, there were some really wobbly times there at the beginning. But also, when it was first announced, you had a lot of original series people hate the fact that this was a new Star Trek and it was not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. But the catch-22 was uh, Shatner and Nimoy and D. Kelly were all very much able to do more movies, and it was still an ongoing thing. And it was kind of a catch-22 between don't you dare recast those roles and you can't call it Star Trek if it's not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the Enterprise. How can it be Star Trek if it's not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the Enterprise? So, as wild as that seems, you can go back and read letters at the time in 86 and 87 about that. And it reminds you a lot today, and that was on slow motion pre-internet fandom, you know? So anyway, so what's, what's um, I just want to see why he has some opinion. Yeah. Well, I have a question, actually. I haven't watched it, and one of the things that's kept me from it is that I've heard how much darker Star Trek Discovery is, and one of the things that I always liked about Star Trek versus Star Wars was that I felt that the universe was more hopeful and that we had this idea that we could be better than we are. So are you finding that people are not liking Star Trek Discovery because it's darker? Well, let me, I, I got a great answer for you, but let me ask you this. Did you watch uh, DS9 all the way through? I did. Okay. Because that was the thing, DS9 was going to be the darker, grittier Star Trek in comparison to Next Gen. Did you enjoy D Space Nine? Even though it got dark at times? because it was supposed to be like, here's the dark before the light at the end of the tunnel again, coming back out into the light. And that's really what discovery is. I think, I think part of it is we've had a whole generation of fandom come along on, on Netflix, which is wonderful, and the Blu-rays when they were remastered. And I think we've almost had like maybe a mini generation of people forget what it's like to be a fan of a show being created. You know, it's, it's easy to be the fan of a dead show, right? I mean, it's there. You can go back and you read the experts. You can watch it yourself 50 times and pick up every little detail. But to be there week to week when it's being cranked out and you, you know, and if, and you don't care what happens inside the walls of a studio. You just want to see what's on your screen at the end. But you can't divorce those two. What happens backstage? There's times, I, I said this year, Discovery's first season, it was amazing they even landed the plane. If it had been anything but Star Trek and anything but launching this new streaming service, Anybody else would have, three or four or five, six months in, would have pulled the plug and said, okay, that's it. We've wasted too much time and money on this thing. You know, it's time to call, call it. And, but no, that could not happen because it was Star Trek, and that could not happen because it was launching this new entity. And they stuck with it and stuck with it and kept paying and paying and paying. And now they expect to, to reap some of the wisdom, you know, some of the rewards and, and the wisdom of how that was done. But to answer your question, I think a lot of people watched... It was just a lot of new for a generation that has had 12 years of nothing but watching 
2005 and before. And the, seri the streaming, the serialized, having to pay for it, having the shows be so serialized, and then, yeah, have it be darker, but it didn't stay there. I mean, yes, yeah, Star Trek can't stay dark, dark, dark. And that's one of the things that, that I thought would always set, again, set Star Trek apart from Game of Thrones, was that that's just, uh, Game of Thrones is just unrelentingly dark. There's one little crack of light, and you go, oh, this can't last. <laughs> you know? Ooh, it's a, it's a, it's a what wedding? Okay. Um, what color was that, you say? So I think it scared a lot of people off the beginning, or they watched the two-part pilot. The third episode was really like a second pilot. It was like a, an intentional six months later, you know, you didn't even see the Discovery or most or half the cast until that show. But a lot of people watched the first one and they resented paying for it and uh, it was just new and the fact that they, they, they all have an individual plot but the show is really streamed together. And then also, unfortunately, I said it, watching the first season Discovery is like getting in a cab ride and driving halfway across the country and you had three drivers and the car never stopped. It's like they, they had transitions of leadership and who was running the show. It, you know, one and then an overlap transition and then at the end. And, and now we've had another five shows into a second season. So we'll see. I think this last one was, was for the better. I think they, they've handled it very well. So if you're wondering if it's too dark for you I'm gonna, and you liked DS9, I'm going to say no. But it will, it will take you. <laughs> it will take you there. But even if you say sign got really dark at the end, you know, had that continuous war. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it was yeah. way darker than at the beginning. At the beginning, it was already kind of dark. Well, at the beginning, they got criticized for being either the show that doesn't go anywhere because they didn't have a ship, they weren't on a ship, or uh, TNG light. And they, they were, and they were, they were finding themselves. The other meme about Star Trek is it takes three years before every show hits its stride. And I said, well, in streaming, in a compressed streaming. Uh, measure maybe uh, I think they've had all three of those years already. It's it the show evolved completely from the first. I mean, what was on paper they got to, but as far as the 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 guts of it, the meat on the bones of it, from the pilot to the fifteenth season finale show was a completely different tone. There were at least the last three shows. At least three different characters gave upright. You know, Kirk, we're Starfleet, and this is why we are. <laughs> We're out here, and this is where we are. Kind of, you know, uplifting, optimistic speeches. It's almost like they were trying to make up for the first third of the <laughs> of the season. But uh, yeah, even when you look throughout throughout the season now, um, there's a lot of um, you can see that they're in a bad situation, not even the in the situation. And you see that there's little subtle, uh, whether it's, it's movements or, or comments that are made that they want to be the Star Trek people we think of from the other series. Um, but they're not able to be it because of the situation. There's some characters that don't want to be it, and uh, uh, for their for right. any number of reasons. But most of them, I think you do see it in every episode. There's little little gems in there that are like, they want to be there, but we're in a war, there's stuff going on, we just can't, we can't. Um, you know, I think it was the same with Deep Space Nine, is that we saw them as that the war started, it got very bad, it got very dark, um, um, at times, particularly for, for Cisco and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew, we knew he, he was doing it because he wanted to, or because, you know, it was the, the circumstances that he was in. Um, so I look at the discovery very much in that, that same thing. Um, I want to complain to Pacey that he used like five more episodes to flesh out. Some things I felt like sometimes it moved too fast, but... Well, that's one thing that has nothing to do with Star Trek storytelling. It's like they're trying to get into this 13-episode the modern storytelling way, the HBO slash BBC storytelling format. And they spend a ton of money. You know, these episodes are like five, six million. I mean, when Next Generation premiered and they were spending a million and a half in 1987 dollars, which I think we figured one day was about three million today, about doubled in 30 years. Um, 30 years. Um, that you know the original series' budgets were like three, four hundred thousand, and they were always getting cut as they went along, and they thinking what, how much bigger the budget was on next gen than you know oh we have so much money and we're it's we're gonna we can do so many tricks and the technology we can do in 20 years later. Well, we're at a quantum level again over that, and you know ne the next gen, especially the first couple of seasons, look. Mm. Um, 
production-wise, and they can be so, you know, we have cinematic TV. But the designers, on the design end, I think the writers are really trying to keep to canon. It's the design canon that they were kind of left to go, we have to be 2018 and compete with Game of Thrones and compete with all the big movies. And they've spent a lot of money to do that, but that's where some of the, some of the controversy is too. Anyway, uh, that serialized storytelling jerking you along and maybe not feeling like you can take time to have a character moment, that's one of the things I think they're trying to some find. Some of the storytelling, they could, have, they could have spent a little bit more time on some of the things they did, um, you know, when, when they, they crossed over. So what about some of you all that have not seen Discovery? Are, are, the, other, the other thing I was say was, after last year, the debut through the fall and winter and then into the spring, and when the conventions, different size ones, different parts around the country, back my old home of Oklahoma and my adopted home in LA both, I was starting to get a feeling that a lot of people didn't resent and didn't watch because of the money per se. There's just a lot of folks that have not tackled the whole how do I even stream television? Um, and kind of like befuddled about it. And I mean, I finally did over the holidays and it took, I felt like I should get continuing education credit. <laughs> I mean, I like, there was no one player person or place to go. I had to research and it was partly, how does the tech work? How do you conceive it in your head? And then it was like, okay, here's what I want. How do I get it? And then I had to go like, look at four or five different places and price plans out and you know, just ordinary mundane things before I finally got what we were comfortable with. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna give up this, then I'm gonna give it up because I'm not gonna spend this, or I, this is not available, you know? But to get all those answers and, and talk to human beings and research, it was, it was exhausting. So I, I totally get it. So I, I want to know if anybody that hasn't seen Discovery wanted to share, maybe. It's conceptually the wrong target audience. Who's in there? Is there a kid in here? Yeah, there's not one kid in there. And I, I deal with kids all day long, there's not one kid that wants we're, we're having a kid point at themselves back here. What? You might want to define kid. Yeah, I'm talking kid. I think kid is a very small Okay. Okay. Well, how did you, you haven't seen any of them? No. Okay, so you got dragged along tonight or what? My, my dad used to watch it and I think I saw some of it. Mm -hmm. I have like pictures of what I remember, but I have pictures. So you talking about like pointed ears guy Spock or, or bald headed guy Picard or? You don't, okay. How did you wind up tonight then? Well, I mean... Did you get dragged along? I, I think so. <laughs> we, we see each other once a week and I saw this and I got confused. I saw the star part and I... I'm a star I, I recognized the star part. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and I invited her and she... Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you know, if this, we're planting a seed here. We're pl you know, and I've, I, I saw the first movie like six times. The, the real Star Wars, when it was called Star Wars, not episode four, New Hope, it was Star Wars. And, um, and I've always enjoyed this. I, but if you told me in 77, that 50 years later, that there'd be this huge Star Wars fandom, especially on just like, you know, a handful of movies, I it was like, what's, what's the there there? I never, I would have said, well, because people got off on the Jedi and it became this quasi-religion maybe kind of thing. I, I was just always shocked that there were like 700 hours of Trek and all this huge universe and that Star Wars is the one that took off. I guess it's because George found a way to sell the action figures. <laughs> and, the, and, you, and you start growing them young, I guess. Right. Yeah. But she made her point. The point is, is that the younger kids don't watch it. And people like me, aren't gonna, I don't have time to sit there and fool around buying something online and all that other stuff. I don't want to even bother with it. Well, that, I mean, that's, and that's totally the part of a divorce from being Star Trek. That's just right. because what, if you, you all the Emmy, the all the Emmy nominees are streaming shows yeah, now. I, I think three fourths of the country has never even seen what's but, winning Emmys now. The point is, is that I their have. age base that they're shooting for is us, and most of us aren't doing that. So it's, it's a it's a fundamental flaw in the logic of which they well, know why this. Yeah, and I would even add on top of that, there's a, there's, a, there's a weird loop going on because it's like if, and I hate to use token terms like millennials or younger generation or whatever, I'll say the under, but if streaming adept people, I think the older you are, the more money you have to spend if you want to. Right. 
and it's almost like the, the more tech savvy you are, or tech adept you are to, to new technology, including jumping off and watching everything on your phone or whatever, that's the generation that has the least money to spend unless they just dedicate, I'm buying these games, I'm buying this, and I just, well, I'll just live in my car for a year. I mean, whatever it is. Or that, or that. But it's like, it's, so like the people who don't, the ones who have the money are the ones who are adept at the tech, and the people who are adept at the tech don't have the money. And that may be very simplistic. No, I, no that's, because I'm adept at the tech. I can do it the perfect. It has to do with, I'm not gonna do it. Well, that's, yes. But, that's, but that goes beyond just Star Trek. But that's the point. Yeah, the point yeah. is that they're putting this on something that nobody, that their target audience is not watching. So stupid. Well, that part of that though, that's why they want to, they know that. I was kidding about the baby, but they've been aware of that. And that's, if streaming is the way of the future, they're then. streaming poorly though. Like I was paying for it and I like work in app testing and this is what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of weeks, like there were horrible nightmares and the technology failed and they couldn't get it for a week and it kept crashing. It was bad. So they're trying to long conservative and it's bad. We're on CBS at 9 o'clock. We kill most people. Yep. You would, but there's also a belief that Star Trek wouldn't command numbers to survive in today's network world. Well, I would say for younger people who are streaming too, if we don't have the money, we're more likely to wait until the end of the season by one month, binge watch it, and then yes. cancel our subscription. And, and there's probably don't. a lot of people who look or just sitting down to watch it right now. Well, that in February was the was the finale, and yeah, in March a lot of people waited. In February, March, April, a lot of people bought the month or the week or whatever it was and binged it. And it, and it was totally legal and free to do that. I watched it for hours and hours. <laughs> well, that, now see now we're getting so this is this is the thing that kind of was a sidebar. This whole thing that came up is is some of this divide not about the show, but about just the fact that it's catching the cusp of streaming and it's just a generational thing. And not about whether you could figure out how streaming works, but people who are, want to see... I mean, there was somebody that was telling me that their, their young parent had an even younger daughter who was very excited to watch Discovery, but she was upset that they didn't drop a whole season like a lot of the streaming series do. Which I thought if they were... I said, please, 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 CBS, don't... I mean, please do it one week at a time so you get the max you know, buzz factor out of it. You have the streaming online, I mean, you have the online debate for a week. If you drop everything at once, people will talk about it solid for a few weeks, but then it goes away. And going week to week to week in like a traditional old boring, you know, network shows, at least it's streaming, but at least dropping one a week makes people talk about it all week long. And it does feel like you're watching, I mean, I just think it was the best of both worlds. And I, they would have lost a lot of promotional value if they had done a whole season at once. But I heard at least one person tell me that their 12, 13 year old daughter was really mad that she had to wait a whole week to see the next episode. Which I'm, I'm all in favor of saying, you know, sometimes it's good to learn how to wait for things you want and not just have everything on demand. Well, I think you see, you know, with, with Game of Thrones, you know, they, they prove very much that going to week to week it really does build. Yes. Particularly if you're doing a serialized where you can end on something big, people, that hit the internet, you know, you drive those analytic, analytic numbers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, what's really... It, well, Game of Thrones, yeah. Walking Dead are the kind of the two big... That's the, that's the currency of, of the mm -hmm. future. I mean, you know, as, as streams are becoming stronger, and, you know, as, as some people, I mean, you know, we got rid of it because, frankly, we never watched it. I, and it cost way more, you know, between the internet and then the five or six different streaming services we have, we're still paying 40 bucks less than we were for cable. Like, we're, we're not going there. Yeah. We, can't, we can't afford it. I would just say though, that... So, so, so streaming has become a cheaper option for, for us as, as two young professionals. Um, you know, to just say, this is the stuff we want to watch, we're only going to pay for that, right? Yeah. for all the other channels that... Yeah, although some people may want to, it may start creeping up again, but yeah. I was going to say, but if the, the... Whoever invented that phrase, cut, cutting the cable, or cutting the cord, the cord cutters of cable, it makes it sound like all you do is, you know, hack out a knife or a pair of scissors and go, ta-da, I've done it, I have cut the cable. It's like, no, it's four or five months of hashing out. You know, there's no easy answers. You have to go find it all yourself. I, I really seriously wanted some continuing education credit after I finished that <laughs> process. Uh, is anybody, um, anybody else that hasn't watched, like wanting to, you're waiting for Blu-rays, or you really, really don't? I, I just didn't watch it initially because all the all the initial reviews on it were just trash. And then also I wasn't going to pay, like you were saying, mm -hmm. to 
just for the one show, eight bucks mm -hmm. a month or whatever it was, you know, and then, then I just kind of just didn't really think about it, you know, because I got other things going. Your, your world actually kept spinning, and uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly, you know, so I mean, maybe I'll get it for a month, but if it's coming out in November, when, you know, once the cold gets here, and you know, I'll probably just get the, get the, get the regular DVD and watch it on DVD. Yeah. And all the bonus features and, you know, et cetera. Yeah, the bonus yeah. features don't really... I, I'm not <laughs> clamoring for the bonus features, you know. I thought you called yourself a Star Trek fan. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah, I, the, but you see what I'm saying, though? There are, it's an interesting time. It's like a new Star Trek hitting at the same time we've had a cross... A generational change and a paradigm shift in in uh, the way we do TV. I mean, Data said that TV was going to be defunct. What in 2035 or something or whatever? I mean, that's the whole side thing. They're predicting the end of commercial network TV. That they're beca that they're dinosaurs and they have to adapt. I don't even have cable or internet at, at home because I just refuse to pay 150 dollars a month for something because I'm not home a lot anyway. Uh, you know, and, I, and I've been taken to the cleaners by Comcast twice, so I mean, I'm not going to pay that much more. So, I, don't, I, so, so I, this is an, a, a Trek Wars thing, although I hope we've planted some seeds with you tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yay. Yay. See, I've, I've had this, and I don't want to go off the subject, I've had this thing this year as I talk to people and saw how this debate, this discussion was growing. So many people were coming to Discovery viewed through the lens of their original series, Next Gen, even a Enterprise or even JJ movie experience. And I thought, you know, it may take a while to show up, but I will start asking now people who, I started calling them DFFs for Discovery fans first. In other words, they found Discovery before they'd seen any other any other trek. So their, their whole experience of Discovery is not colored, good or bad, by any of the other older shows, prior shows, I should say. Um, and that's been a lonely hunt. <laughs> I found three or four of them at cons, because even a convention is people who, A, can afford, to, whether it's like down the street from their house or it's like Vegas or Comic-Con, you have to be able to afford to go, have the time to go, and then have the wherewithal to even know, to know that it's there and go. So, you know, they, you think about, oh, it's all the DC and anime, uh, you know, superheroes and anime kids and all of that as younger at Comic-Cons, but even then, those people don't get into a room, and usually every convention room I have looks like this demographic spread. And um, the times when I've been able to talk to an 18-year-old or 20-year-old or 25-year-old just to see what the reaction is has been interesting, but it's not exactly setting the, the meters on fire as far as numbers go. But they're out there. CBS All Access is thrilled. They say they're growing. They're rolling out a bunch of new programs, including Star Trek. So they're doing, Jason Peel is doing, I mean, Jordan Peel is doing a reboot of The Twilight Zone. Um, there's a modern sci-fi, woo, kind of weird show on called Strange Angel that's on right now. I haven't watched it yet. But they're trying to madly fill up original content because it's, they knew that it's, they jumped out ahead of everybody else. They took some flack, I think, from people. But that's, if that's the way, if that's the way media is going. That's, that's the way media is going. Um, with the, the I'm trying to cut up on original content and the, the four Star Trek shows coming down the pipeline plus Discovery, do they take a Disney approach and start, you know, in a year or two, oh. pulling Star Trek off of Netflix and Hulu and everything so that then CBS All Access is your, is your Star Trek yeah. access point? Um, well, they did the deal with, see, globally, Outside of the U.S. and Canada, the rest of the world sees um, Discovery on Netflix, which, <laughs> when you bring that up in America, in the U.S., pisses people off even more. Because <laughs> they're like, if I was in England, I'd be watching it anyway, because I'd already have Netflix. And then one time, I never will forget one, one of my Tuesday Facebook Live shows, because it's one, so people in the U.K. and Europe are all on. And uh, two different people popped up and said, well, I never subscribed to Netflix until I subscribed for Discovery. And I'm like, okay, well, there you go. Yeah, if I was on Netflix, I'd watch it, you know, but I'm not going to subscribe. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. For one specific show. Right. But anyway, they've had this deal for however long, and there was even some, I saw interviewing with some of the guys, at, uh, the network people at TCA, not at Vegas, who were asked, will, say, the Patrick show, 
the Patrick Stewart Show, sponsored by... No, they, um, <laughs> just happy music comes out when he comes in. Um, asking if that would be on Netflix too, like Discovery. And they're saying, well, the way they're dealing with Netflix is, is different. Than... So they were even waffling on whether it was the same. Deal. But Netflix pumped in a ton. They said up front, Netflix provided the global, Netflix is 188 countries, big and small, and 186 of them. You know, have all of them but Canada and the U.S. have have discovery, and that they provided two thirds, three fourths of the of the money for discovery the first season. So they got a free, CBS got a free pass. Now they got a they sure paid out the wazoo for it the way it took 18 months to get off the ground and and all that, but longer than they thought. But um, they're good, they're tangled up with Netflix. So how they untangle and they when they get to the point where they say we're putting it all on all, all access. There's nothing more on Netflix, like Disney is starting to do, with their own channel. It will be interesting to watch that dance, how that happens, because they've got the global factor involved too. As you tell Discovery, you can you can put it out everywhere up here, so they can pull Star Trek and everything here, except right, right. Oh, yeah, they can still they can still slice and dice it. It's easy. You pull that plug and plug that one in. I know there's kind of a, I don't know, uh, a, an uproar or a shorter about um, having to pay for discovery. And I, I think I was initially kind of in that camp too. Like, oh, it's like my God given right to have free Star Trek. I was going to say, I, that, should be, that was a bumper sticker, I think. God meant for Star Trek to be free. But it's like, I, 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 st I really started thinking about it. And I was like, I could go to McDonald's and get a, an extra value meal. Or I could pay the same amount and watch my favorite TV show. Like, I mean, when I think about it in that kind of... For a month. Yeah, for a whole month. For um, the four new ones and then whatever you want to go back yeah, to see. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't go to McDonald's once a month and I get to watch that. that well, that's kind of what some people... Because it's about choices. And we were talking about, like... The under 30s, if they don't have that much money to do it, but they make choices, and media and games take precedent over eating, <laughs> some, you know, kind of thing. So it's it's it gets back it gets back down to choices. But see what we're doing here, and what I didn't mean for us to do totally, was um, you start talking about discovery, and it turns into this whole thing about media and all access and streaming, and people, and there are, there are. You know, Trek fans and shippers and people who go, but can we talk about the show? You know, because it's got, it has a lot of critiques and criticism and, and a lot of people that love Star Trek love it for reasons. Um, like all, you know, like the first, the first gay couple in Star Trek, uh, even though one was killed, which caused a lot of controversy even there. Yeah, yeah, the barrier gays thing. And they say, no, 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 he's coming back. He's, he's still in the show. But uh, all the people of color who have been killed off, and I it was like, well, there was one straight white guy in the whole, whole thing. And then you found out he was the mirror and got killed at the end. So, oh, sorry, spoiler. So it's like the whole cast is so diverse. And the other guy who's the straight, well, he's white anyway, I don't know. Um, he's the alien. So it's like, does he count? And there was even some odd kind of fringy reaction to, like, the, it wasn't a universal love fest when they announced Patrick Stewart's show. And there were people... I think, born today, who are saying, oh, great, the next Star Trek's going back to this old white guy, old straight white guy, and the, and the vanillaness of next generation. I'm like, there was one article that was very controversial. Somebody wrote for NBC's website. But it was like, I'm sorry, didn't that have, like, LeVar Burton and Michael? Weren't there, like, two black men and two women? And, and you know, I... Star Trek in 96 won a diversity and casting award from the Screen Actors Guild for all the shows, like a group, as a group franchise. It's interesting how people's perceptions shift or whatever, but... Um, don't, don't watch what? This, all this diversity, this, I, I don't want, I don't want... I just want to watch a show that's entertaining. I don't want to be forced to have somebody's political preference on my face. So you never watched Star Trek before? <laughs> that's not, no, that's, it's not, that was not thrown in your face in most shows. That it was, was just part of the cast. Sure. It was subtle. You're saying, you were saying it was subtext and it was subtle and... Yes. Wh which is, that's, yeah. They never wanted it to be... Right. And that, that's, yeah. that's okay. But I, someone's agenda does not do my face.
Well, I, I don't... It's, in, it's on the internet where it's a big deal, and the show they don't make a big deal about anything. It's all just, all just characters. It's everyone talking about it in media, and on, on, on the internet that's saying, this, this clearly means this, or this is doing that. None of, none of that, none of that crap to the show. Like, well, that's what I'm saying. That... You know, it's, 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 you know, I mean, yes, it's a reflection of, you know, just as, you know, did, did uh, in the emergency, did they have some motives in why they did certain things, why they cast, why they told certain stories, absolutely, and that's there, but um, you know, there's a lot of reading in um, that may or may not be there, and, and again, because of social media, we do hear from some of the creatives yes, um, that does, I think, sometimes feed that more, so we have more insight than we did, you know, in the, in the 60s um, into, well, you know, I mean, we've seen you know, like Mark Cushman's book, you, uh, um, you, know, you see a lot of what was going on behind the scenes, that we didn't know until you know, decades later. And they, they worried the first interracial kiss between Uhura and Kirk, and they'd lose some southern stations, and they did. But, you know, they did it anyway. So, so yeah, it's just that, yeah, social, whatever it is, social media amplifies it. It's, it's probably always there for good and bad, but social media has just amplified everything. And, and you can do it anonymously where people get unhinged when they're anonymous. If there's things face-to-face, -face, people are still civil, I think, to people. But do you think the diversity of that question has been worse than, say, when uh, they had Kate Mulgrew become the captain or um, Avery Brooks become, become the See, captain? See, those, those seem like proud moments, and nobody, you know, I, what I remember, and my wife worked on Voyager, was they had announced there would be a, a woman captain, and they had a horrible time casting it. And they were literally, I mean, and Jerry Taylor was a co it was very close to her. She wasn't, it wasn't just lip service. But it got the point where somebody was saying at the network, guys, we, we want to do this, we know you want to do this, but we might want to just have a guy back up and realign. I mean, there was a plan, but if they went with a male captain, they would flip and have the first officer and doctor be female characters. That that, was, that would be the comp. And when that got out, this is the fax days, but the fax number of the, right, of the heart building got out, and Janet would come home every day while they were, they were out of production. They filmed everything they could film without a captain. I mean, it's famous now, right? jean vierre Pujol filmed two days when they, oh, we got an Oscar winner. And some of them were going, she's not cut out to be a captain. She's not a commanding type. And Kate Mulgrew had a horrible, bad reading the first time. And they pulled four people in after jean vierre left. And she just totally nailed it. And they were like, why didn't we cast her the first time? You know, what, what was going on that we didn't have her the first time? But all through that period, their fax machine was just going 24-7. Don't you dare not cast a woman. Don't you dare say you're going to cast. I will never watch this show if you say you're going to have a woman. And don't, you know. The other, the, don't you dare cast a woman. Don't you dare. I mean, that was not a thing. Now, maybe some people are remembering it now and anecdotally, but in real time, at the time, that was, it wasn't like somebody said, well, boy, are they going out on a limb by having a woman or having a black guy be a, you know. I don't remember that from, from them, which is why some of the, and it seems, the other thing is sad to say, speaking of Star Wars, Star Wars fandom and Star Wars online community and the actresses and writers that have been hounded off their Twitter and Instagram over that kind of thing, just ginned up weirdness. There was a little bit of, when the first trailer came out and Burnham and George were, trekking uh, through the desert, um, and that you had a little bit of that, yeah, you've got social justice warrior, two women of color as your leads. It's like, it's okay, one of going to die soon, it's okay. <laughs> but you had a little bit of that, but I mean, I really, it's that and some of the other genres out there, the big, you know, the, the movie, the, the DC and the Marvel universes are all kind of creatively in their fandoms. Or, it's, like, it's like everything goes in cycles, which is true, and there's always pendulum swings. And it's like right now, all these guys that have, it's like Star Trek invented all this stuff before there were fancy buzzwords for it. We had a cinematic universe before we had the term for it, right? And now all the guys that have been, all the people, these franchises that have been running with that the last 10, 15 years, DC and Marvel and Star Wars and building, are all kind of re-examining themselves, and now here's Star Trek kind of boldly going and exploding and saying, here's our plans. And, and I know some people are saying, don't overdo it. Star Wars is burning out, don't overdo it. Well, I think it's been the, the, war, the Star Trek world is so much bigger than any of those. And I know I have comic fans that would say, I've been a 
you know, Mar DC f Batman fans since, you know, 1956, and I could quote you the 5,000, you know, every plot line from every comic, it's very rich, it's very rich, you know, I could see that. But I'm just saying, maybe beyond that, Star Wars, uh, Star Trek is the richest of any of these. There's 700-something hours on film. Take out the clinkers, even, and you still got, you know, 500 hours on film. So, versus, you know, 12, 14, 15 hours or 20 hours of Star Wars movies. But not to compare back and forth, but I, I, I think it's time that Star Wars, Star Trek is there and there's plenty of material to do, which is what we said 20 years ago. Do a Klingon show, do a Captain April show, do a, you know, you've got all these areas you could go to and times, eras, not just areas, right? So I, I think we've got a long, as long as they're made well, I think we've got a long ways to go before we're worried about the burnout that some of the other genres, right, franchises are maybe starting to deal with now. Or maybe it's still all just perception and average Joe fan and Jeanette fan are totally happy, which is the other part of the equation here. How much of the angry, I used to call it the angry, t there was Wrath of Khan. When the word got out that Spock was going to be killed on Wrath of Khan, there were some really off Spock fans, you know, back before social media, but also there was no bloody A, B, C, or D. It was just the original guys and gals, and that was all. And they did a professional marketing campaign and did this whole thing and took out a full page in Variety that said, if you leave Spock killed off, you will lose 28% of your box office through boycotts and your toy and merchandise sales will drop 30%. And that's freaking, we all, you know, the Golden Glove Wrath of Khan movie, right? Much less next gen and every new iteration that's come along. So part of this is normal, but, you know, it's just the growth spurt. Yeah, yeah. I've been going <clears throat> to these flashback cinemas this summer, and I just went to see Rap the Con again at, on the big screen. Uh -huh. It was really good, but I heard that Leonard Nimoy was not all that excited about doing the Star Trek movies until they became really, really popular, and that's probably why they killed him off, but then they resurrected him because he decided he'd stay on with the rest of them. Yeah, just, just like Brent Spiner in Nemesis. No, Leonard would not do Wrath of Khan unless he was killed off at the beginning. He totally, during the, from the beginning to end of that, and Wrath of Khan started off as a cheap, glorified TV movie. The TV department was going to do it for theaters. Kind of like the Batman movie was, you know, in the 60s. Um, you know, sometimes a bomb is just a bomb. Or something, sometimes you can't get rid of a bomb. That's what, yeah. Um, and then as the... Uh, Nick Meyer was so amazing, and they were seeing the dailies come back, and, the, and Ricardo Montalban was just exploding was and blooming. And, and as they you know, started from square one with five crappy scripts, and Nick Meyer took no credit and put them together into what became, and this thing was way bigger than the sum of its parts. And as they went through that, his whole attitude changed, and when they killed him off at the end and they did test audiences and people were coming out, they, they wanted to have the uplifting ending, and people were coming out crying and depressed. The whole thing of the coffin on the, on the Genesis, you know, on the Genesis planet, planet, that was the little ad at the end because Leonard would not do the movie unless he was killed off. So he totally changed his tune and it wasn't about money. You know, Leonard, it wasn't about money. And part of what sweetened the deal was they let him direct. He got his third, I mean, his, his first directing credit on the third movie, on Search for Spock. But, um, but that's what the deal with that was. But he, yeah, he totally turned around. That and they gave him and Shatner the equal. Actually, it was the best of the first one. It was kind of bombed. And then the rest of the time came out and everybody goes, whoa. You know. yeah, although some people still, people will still defend the first movie as the most cinematic sci-fi movie of all the Star Trek. I'm just saying, it's just the yeah. biggest, the biggest concept. Box office, though, but rather kind of change. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And visually for the time, what, what an amazing. And the, the soundtrack by James Warner was fantastic. Today was his birthday, or yesterday was his birthday. I saw that slime. Yeah, oh yeah, that nautical. Dun 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have kind of a right turn question. Because uh, we've been talking about like all the older series and things like that, uh, and we have new discovery. Uh, Thank you. I was just. <laughs> it's all good, but I, I feel like we have new discovery, but it's also it, it's new track, but it's not forward track. We're doing a prequel oh. series. 
Uh, and I, I, me personally, that was the hardest thing for me to get past was like kind of the visual dictionary that you're seeing in the show uh, because it does it just doesn't match up with you know original TO. Um, and after I got past that, I was fine with it. But why do you think that they chose to do a new Trek series instead of moving forward in the timeline, pulling back? It's it's hard to conceive this now, and I I don't know this 100%, but what I know and get is that I think this one series, maybe more so th the biggest since the original series and Gene's little two-page memo, right, that he went in and, and they pit, he and her solo pitched to the networks with. I think this series more than anyone else is out of one person's driving vision, and everything else was put together for that. It was, and, and as much as Brian was bemoaned and people went, oh no, Brian Fuller is the guy with the old, the old Star Trek credit and all these other newbies don't and now we're lost, we're lost. But it was Brian, he did a pilot for a remake of, of the Munsters. Yeah, the Munsters. Whatever their address, 1313 Mockingbird Lane or something. And it did not sell into a series. And this was after he'd done Pushing Daisies and was very popular and, you know, kind of cultish. And he really kind of took the monster, and it was black and white TV, but they made it color. And he like went way plush and way overexposed colors, you know, really vibrant. And this kind of out there, over the top production design. And I never saw it, it's available to see. I keep meaning to watch it. And I was, and it was kind of panned because of that. And I kind of was afraid that maybe he would, as much as he loved Star Trek, that when he was like unleashed and given all the power and all the budget, that maybe it would get goofy. And two or three of his points were, he wanted the Klingons totally redesigned, he wanted this, this, this. And some of the things that people had been most critical about visually were some of the things that were his ideas originally. And by the time he left, there were so many million dollars down the road they weren't about to undo. Even, even filming in Toronto, they wished they had filmed in L.A. by the time it was done, but they did a study and found out it would have been cheaper just to build new sets in L.A. than to tear everything down, move it, and bring it to L.A. And then, you know, they've got a, all the people in Toronto, all the crafts and actors and stand-ins and, you know, guilds love it. Having, and there's a lot of shooting, and it's not like that's weird. But I, I wish. It's not that God meant for Star Trek to be free. It's that God meant for Star Trek to be shot in L.A. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that's my... That's my beat. So, um, I know we wandered from what you asked me, I know. Just the, the why said it. Oh, that was just, uh, Brian very famously said, there's one thing I always wondered about, that I always wondered about, and this show is gonna answer that question. And I'm still, still trying to figure out what exactly was the question that led him to have it 10 years before Kirk and Spock. Something, I guess, with the Klingons, or when was the Klingon War, or whatever, which I never thought there was one, but I don't wanna go too much in the weeds. But. But it's, I think a lot of those things were original Brian ideas, and even after he was left, they were all there to deal with, them. which is why the whole Patrick uh, idea, and it's 20 years after you last saw him in Nemesis, and it's his real age, so he's 77, will be 78 probably by the time this thing sees the light of day. They're doing it real time, and he'll probably be not a shiny guy in a shiny chair on a shiny bridge, but he's either a rogue or he's retired or he's an ambassador. He has to do something covert or subversive or something and gather a gang together and have new faces and some of the old ones that... But you can have everybody from that... You know, all the DS9 and Voyager people that I was laughing last week never got a dinner, like Red Buttons used to say. All those guys that never got a movie can, you know, have... that fans love can come in, not, not like, oh, here's the DS9 clump of cast, or here's the Voyager cast clumped together, but individual characters that make sense for the story, maybe, can be, and guest, you know, leading guest characters can, can turn up again or something. Who knows, we'll see, though. Yeah? Just wondering, um, what was the, the run plan for that one? So, like, originally Star Wars was supposed to be the five-year mission, it ended up being three years, and then when Enterprise was supposed to be longer. You mean Star Trek? It, it ended up being uh, like one year short or something like that. Yeah. So are they committed to doing a full run? Well, it's if it will probably be a thirteen episode. Oh, you mean like will Discovery go seven years or whatever? Yeah. Well, I know like with uh, with Next Gen it was seven years. With uh, well, see that was the bookkeeping and the budget at the time. Yeah. They syndicated Next Gen, so they weren't paying any network fees, but they had to go market to market to sell it. They did. 
and they sat down in 87 and said, here's our seven-year projection. We're going to factor X for inflation, X for salaries, X for technology getting better. And starting in day one, we're going to spend this much a show, 26 a year, yada, yada, yada. And they had the thing. And that's why when they were at their highest after seven years, they're like, nope, it's done. Like People are like, are you, you're at your high point. Are you kidding? Why are you going away now? It's like, nope, this was the plan. We spend any more, have any more. It, it throws off all of our money. You know, and we're going to make this much from toys and games and books. And we're going to make this much from, from DVDs and you know, VHS tapes and DVDs. And it was all a master blueprint. But the, but the business, it's all different. I mean, the, the world is different now, so. It's not syndicated TV, it's streaming, and it's a streaming model, and they're launching a new thing for CBS. And but, I mean, uh, do they have an idea of how many years they want it to run? Not how many episodes? I think, they, I think they had an idea for a second year when they started, but after that, it's just kind of, let's see how it goes. Yeah, I, there's no, I, the writers have no shortage of ideas swimming around in their heads for what to do. But, you know, like, real time and real world may affect some of that. It just seemed like there was such a big hole after Enterprise went off. There was. <laughs> Twelve years. Well, but see, again, that's the perception of the Rick Berman era ended, the Viacom, I call it the Viacom divorce, happened. And, you know, uh, Mama CBS didn't care anything for the kid, but Daddy Paramount took it out for a spin every three or four years, <laughs> right? And there was a little bit of money going back, and, like, Paramount was paying CBS not to do, like, a million a year not to do a TV show. But... Les Moonves and CBS, the, the conceit was, oh, the audience is burned out. Well, no, I think the, there was producer fatigue, not franchise fatigue. And so, yeah, so we had 12 years of fallow times, and then somebody just, it's, it, things never happen until they happen. It's just crazy. It's like after Enterprise went down, people thought there'd be no, some pundits said that Star Trek was so burned and tired out that there'd be nothing for 10 or 20 years until it was rested, you know. And then here J.J. comes along and says, I'm going to take advantage of this, and I'm going to do a Star Trek movie in the, my bundle of movie deal I just did. And they're like, what? Like a year later. And pe nobody thought there'd be talk of a new Trek a year later, which is why people got so excited. And the whole time I was going, it may be a hit, it may be a bomb, but it's just a movie. You'll wake up the next morning, and you'll go, oh, I have to wait three more years for two more hours? I, I want a series back. I want a series back, you know. And finally it happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't memorize the bio about you before I came tonight, but could you remind me how, what was your first connection to Star Trek? And, and As a fan or professionally? Um, both. Both, yeah. <laughs> uh, my ninth grade science teacher. Shame, inside. I can't believe you're not watching Star Trek, Larry. And I went home and watched it after school. Um, and then professionally, I had been a fan and I wanted, and I was doing a fan published version of B. Joe's Concordance annually. And um, I, when desktop publishing and laser printers first came in, and it, it was all on my forehead VCR no, in Oklahoma, no, no help doing anything. And uh, and Richard Arnold, who was Gene Roddenberry's assistant, was at a convention, and I showed him, and he was like, oh, my God, because they, there was no memory alpha, there was no internet, there were no professional books like the Akuta's Encyclopedia. If they wanted to know something from a prior show, they had an assistant go pull scripts out of the file and sit there and thumb through scripts trying to find something. So when he saw that, he went back, and everybody had copies of my concordance at the Hart Building for, for two or three years. And they said, you should have this guy do a, do a book. And I, I was like, yes, you should. <laughs> and, um, but they, po Pocket Books was so unsure about how things would sell, like the novels they were doing. But the nonfiction and the behind-the-scenes books, they were like, well... I mean, finally, Mike and Rick's, Mike Akuta and Rick Sternbach's technical manual was supposed to come out the fourth season. Like, maybe there's been enough interest. It's like, yes, there's been enough interest. And they did like an order for 5,000 copies and it was like sold in two days and they did another five and it was sold, you know, in two days. I mean, it was crazy. They finally upped the selling and it sold. And it came out a year later, a year late, at the same time mine did. And mine sold a ton, a ton, a ton. So we're like, oh, I guess we can do behind the scenes books now. It was kind of, and it was just the first five seasons. And your book was what the importance? The, the Next Generation Companion. Yeah, so then halfway through they went, we're gonna do this, Larry, and went, that's great. And like, yeah, you've got it written already, right? I'm like, yes. And they're like, okay, oh, we don't want an encyclopedia. We're going to have Mike do that and combine it with B. Joe's. 
we want you to do the behind the scenes making a book. I was like, well, you've got it written, right? I'm like, I have, I have factoids. I don't have anybody interviewed. So I had three months to do the first five years, and which stretched into six years, six months, because Leonard was fighting over an image issue at the time with licensing, and he wouldn't approve any Spock pictures. And the biggest news of the fifth season was, was Spock is on Next Generation. So I got three extra months to write, and that's when I learned that in Hollywood, the most important thing is not the words, it's the pictures. I mean, figuratively and literally. So yeah, I did that in like six months, and that was, that was it. And then after that came the fact files and the official fan club and the magazine. And so it sounds and like you were given access to all the right people in order to get it right. I was, but on the three month plan, <laughs> uh, I had to learn. I thought, yes, here's an official author, red carpet, open the gate, ta-da, right? That's the pinnacle. It's like, you no, know, this is the thing of, people think of, in the old days think of Paramount as a monolith, or they think of CBS as, no, there's production, there's licensing, there's publicity, there's home DVDs, home entertainment. They've all got their own turfs, and if they can all match up, great. Or if they can find a way to match up, that's wonderful. But I had to send all, there was an off-site, publicist then, and I was supposed to send my questions and who I wanted to interview to licensing, who then sent it to publicity, who then sent it back to per people in production. And all those people were busy, and it was the end of the season, it was like spring, and the people in production were just trying to get the hell out for hiatus. They'd been shooting for six, nine months, and I didn't know that. And I went out for a, a week, and nothing happened, and I finally just two people I knew on the show, I just went over and the publicist screamed at me for going, if you go on the lot, I'm not being responsible for anything you do. And I'm like, like what? I'm like, a, like a, what, what did you think was gonna happen? I'm like a fifth grader gonna go steal pointed Spock ears and sell them on <laughs> eBay? What did you think? Anyway, that was crazy. And after that, I went out for two weeks and then I went out for two months in 94 when they were doing the movie and, and everything. And the second edition, the red edition came out. And when we decided to move, my wife kept on Voyager. By that time though, the good thing of that was it, was, it was hell at the beginning, but by the time I went out and made my own way, I had made my own way. Nobody, nobody opened a door magically for me and I walked in and walked out. I had to get everything I got. And by that time, people knew that I was a straight shooter and they could trust me. I could, I could leave the skeletons buried if I needed to and wouldn't go blab. And I would also deal with people's, first time I walked in to see Ira Baird, he had just been burned by an interviewer did a whole magazine section. And I walked in, and before I even met him, he said, well, are you gonna have me over? And I was like, I just met him. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I eventually got, as you saw, I got his trust too. But that was, it was kind of an interesting beginning. But after I got over that hump, then I was like in like Flynn for ages. People knew they could trust me. And even after the Next Gen book ended, uh, as you see my CDs over there, I kept, that up with Voyager and DS9 and Enterprise. So to the point where a lot of the behind the scenes people now say, thank God we had that hour long interview later because it all runs together now. I can't remember anything and they have to sit down and do an interview or do a DVD interview or something. And they're like, I just pull your books down and go, like, go back and see what I said in 93 and I, I'm good. <laughs> Would it be safe to say you're not teaching ninth grade science anymore? No, I never taught ninth grade science. No, I said my ninth grade science teacher shamed me into going home and watching because she couldn't believe it. Yeah. Anyway, well, it's about 20 till. I know they're, they're, you close at nine, right? Yeah. So if you want to, I can come over to the table. Thing, but I have some CDs on sale and some photos. I have cards for the new edition of Stellar Cartography, which is the official and very lovely and now over big wall maps and a book. Um, set for Star Trek comes out October 9th and you can pre-order that. I've got a card for it. And I've got, just got some information over there about my podcasts and things. So if you want to adjourn to the banquet room or something, <laughs> we, can, we can do that. But thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.